song this morning will be page 273, page 273. Sunday, so we'll be uh, keeping all the kids upstairs for our service today. After our service today, we will have our meal uh, together. They'll be in prepackaged boxes downstairs. You can come through and pick up a box. Uh, we've got cold barbecue chicken, potatoes, and green beans so in a roll. So um, even if you're leaving after the morning service, make sure you get a box to take with you. The tables are set up uh, downstairs and also outside is available too. Uh, just try to spread out as much as possible. That would be appreciated. Um, after today, our next thing we have on our calendar is our midweek service on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. The adults will be um, doing our Bible meeting, or excuse me, our prayer meeting and Bible study upstairs while the kids are downstairs for their Awana club. So please, uh, if you're able to be here for that, uh, please show up. The prayer list from last Wednesday night is on the back table. If uh, you weren't here, we have a lot of people that have been under the weather lately, so please pick up a prayer list so you can pray for that as well. Saturday, we will be having our fall festival. From noon until 2, we'll be hosting that back in the gym and in the side yard. So I found some, some uh, mini pumpkins for the kids to pick and some, some games and snacks for the kids. And also next Sunday night, uh, October 11th, we will have our bi-monthly planning meeting and our business meeting after the evening service. So following the 6 o'clock service, next Sunday night, we'll have um, our bi-monthly planning meeting and business meeting. And uh, our next lunch, uh, lunch Bible study and fellowship, we have one on Friday. We're going to do that every other Friday. So we're going to have a lunch. Our next lunch Bible study and fellowship will be Friday, October, it should be 16th, not 26th, October 16th from noon until 1. If you, if you want to jump in on that study, let me know. We do have some books available. You can go home and get caught up if you missed uh, the first video lesson. And then also we uh, later this month, October 28th, we have missionaries to China. Um, uh, Vincent Blanchard and his wife will be with us during the Wednesday night service 
um, on October 28th. So just a few things to be aware of and to be in prayer for. And if they don't come forward now, we will prepare to receive the offering. <coughs> and if you come forward, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for the privilege and opportunity of being in your house. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I pray that all that we do today um, will demonstrate our gratitude for your love for us. Lord, I pray that now as we have the opportunity to return a portion of what you have blessed us with, I pray that you help us do a cheerful heart. Help yes. us be good stewards of all the entrust to our care. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. song this uh, morning. <laughs> this morning will be page 198, and I'll have you stand again, if you would, please. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, page 198. <coughs>
Lexi's going to come forward and we're going to sing that special together. The song is called There Is a Remedy. When we think about all the, the trouble that's going on in the world around right now and all the, the, the discord and confusion, uh, we see that we do still have a remedy. We have an answer to that in Jesus. So we're going to sing a song called There's a Remedy. <coughs> Psalm chapter 71, in your Bible is where we're going to be today, if you want to find Psalm chapter 71, that's where we'll be reading from today. Today we'll be in a new study, which will be part of our ongoing re-series. If you've been here for a while, you know that we've been going through and studying books of the Bible and topics that have major themes that begin with the letters R-E. We saw redeeming love in the book of Ruth. We saw restoration in Ezra. We had a series on rejoicing in the book of Psalms, and then most recently, last week, we concluded a study on rebellion in the book of Jonah. Today we're going to begin a new part of our re-series with a focus on recharging. This is a time of year when, even under normal circumstances, people typically need to be recharged spiritually. Hmm. Under normal circumstances, this is the week where the kids have finally been back to school for about a month, and we're starting to get back into our routines a little bit. This is a time when a lot of people return to their more normal schedule after possibly taking some time off to visit family or traveling during the summertime. And what we'll see in this series is that there are times when all of us become spiritually tired and fatigued. We feel worn down physically, we feel worn down emotionally, and we're going to see that there are times when we feel worn down spiritually. And we're going to look at examples in this series of people who could relate to our feelings of being worn down. 
And we're going to see from God's word steps that we can take to become refreshed, rejuvenated, and how we can recharge our spiritual batteries. So it'll probably come no, as no surprise to you that when we look to God's word to refresh us, we're going to be looking a lot at the book of Psalms during this series. So if you found Psalm chapter 71... We're going to be reading verses 12 through 23. So if you found Psalm chapter 71, I'll invite you to stand with me if you're able to. Out of the honor of the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Starting at verse 12. Oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste to my help. Let them be confounded and consumed if their adversaries soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor to seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to every one that is to come. Thy righteousness also, O oh God, is very high, who has done great things. O oh God, who is like unto thee? Thou which hast showed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken me again, and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Thou shalt increase my greatness, and comfort me on every side. <clears throat> I will also praise thee with psaltery, even with the truth, O oh my God. Unto thee will I sing with a harp, O thou holy one of Israel. Verse 23, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee, and my soul which thou hast redeemed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you so much for that word we just read, for being, yeah. for being redeemed. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for looking down from heaven and looking past our sinful hearts, yeah. looking past our shame, looking past our guilt, and seeing something, finding something within us that was worth redeeming. Uh. Lord, we, we can't understand this. This, this, this love is, is, is too wonderful for us to even comprehend. So Lord, we thank you for it. Father, I pray now as we look to your word today. I pray for those that are struggling spiritually. People who are falling away. People who are having a hard time in their walk with you. Yeah. Lord, as always, nobody needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. Lord, I yeah. pray you'll speak to us. Speak to our hearts today. Help us to walk out of here more recharged, more re more rejuvenated in our walk with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We pray all these things in the perfect, precious, powerful name of Jesus. Everybody said Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. Our key text for today that we're going to kind of spend a lot of time talking about is in verse 20. Because there's a phrase in this verse that captures really the focus for this entire series. In verse 20 it says this. It says, Thou, which has showed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken me again, and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. So the phrase that we want to focus on is where it says there, bring me up again. That's what we desire. That's what we're talking about, is returning, refreshing, becoming recharged in our spiritual lives. And what we're going to see is that if that's your desire, to have your spiritual batteries recharged, we're going to see from our text today, that's possible. It's normal to go through times where our spiritual batteries start to run low and even die. But it's possible to get them charged back up. And the author here recognized, if you'll notice back at the beginning of the verse, it says this, that God shall quicken me again. That word quicken means to make alive or to revive. And we see the desire to be revived and be recharged spiritually right at the very beginning of the text that we read today. And we're going to see through this text steps that we can take and we can apply to our own lives to experience rejuvenation, refreshing, and recharging in our own lives. And one thing that I love about the Bible, among many things, is that it's just so transparent. It's so open. And one thing that I appreciate about the Bible is that it doesn't hide people's sins or their shortcomings. 
We see David's spiritual victories, but we also see his failures. Yeah. We see Peter's boldness preaching the gospel, but we also see his denial of Christ. Yeah. We see Noah as the obedient follower of God who followed the instructions to build the ark, even when everybody else thought that he was crazy. And we also read about him becoming drunk and bringing shame upon himself. We read about Jacob being chosen by God and having his name changed to Israel. But we also read about him deceiving his father mm -hmm. and taking advantage of his brother. The Bible is straightforward. It doesn't cover up or sugarcoat people's sins. And we read that when Paul, we read in God's word that, that Paul, and Mo, Paul and Moses were both murderers. It doesn't cover up that Rahab was a harlot. God's word is open and transparent. And one area that God's word is so open and transparent about is when it comes to feelings and emotions. And we saw when we went through our series in Psalms about how David and the other authors there are just so open about the emotional struggles that they made. The struggles that they, even as saved people, they endured related to their, their feelings and their emotions. We saw how it touched on feelings of confusion, feelings of anxiety, worry, Feeling uh, angry, feeling scared, being afraid. And today we're going to see a feeling mentioned in our text that if we're all honest, we can relate to. And we see this feeling being verbalized in the form of a request. Our first point for today, if you're following along, on the back of your bulletin is request. In verse 12 it says, O oh God, be not far from me. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, if we're going to be honest with God, there are times in our spiritual lives when we just don't feel as close to God. There are times when even though our relationship with God is secure, our fellowship with Him just feels distant. If we're going to be honest, there are times when we get distracted during our prayer time. Our mind starts to wander about all the things we have to get done that day. We can lose focus while reading God's Word when we think about everything else that's going on in our lives. Have you ever done that? I've done that. When I'm reading my Bible and I realize I'm down at verse 21, but I wasn't really paying attention while I was reading. Uh -huh. yeah. And I didn't retain what I had just read, so I had to go back and start all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just give you a word of encouragement and just tell you it's okay? It's normal. Give yourself some grace. There's a simple but, but powerful sentiment that is recognized in verse 10, and it's related to humility. Because, see, a proud person would never admit when there's a distance between them and God. Yeah. And because they refuse to admit it, that distance gradually grows and grows and grows and grows to where it's no longer just a distance, it's a complete disconnect. We've all known people who are gradually just slipping farther and farther away from the Lord. But in their own eyes, in their own mind, they were fine. And when you try to point it out to them, try to warn them, hey, you're falling away from God, they blew you off. They, you don't know what you're talking about. And because they refuse to acknowledge the distance between them and God, are now living in a state of mostly spiritual disconnection from Him. But look at the humility that we see here in verse 10. The spirit of meekness, this humble spirit, is the hinge upon which everything that we're going to see today depends upon. Now, we're going to see refreshment. We're going to see recharging. But it all starts with a humble request. Oh, God, be not far from me. Verse 12, rather, not verse 10. I think I misspoke there. Oh, God, be not far from me. Can I just point out that until you humble yourself, you won't experience refreshment, rejuvenation, or recharging in your spiritual life. In the book of Proverbs, it tells us there are seven things God hates. Mm -hmm. And the first thing mentioned is the proud book. First Peter chapter 5 tells us that God resists the proud book. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, it says that God won't even hear the prayer of his people until they first humble themselves. I want you to think for a minute and be honest with yourself. Is there pride in your heart? And if there is, recognize how detrimental that is to your relationship with God. We just saw that in the past four weeks with Jonah. The pride, the stubbornness, the rebellion. What does that lead to in your life? Distance from God. Disconnect from God's will. 
Think about the words that you use. The tone that you use. Now there's some things, we're going to be honest, there's some things that we can say that people think are funny. There's some things that people say that they think it's okay, but God says that he resists that and you're proud. In James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. And the first step we see here from our text today to drawing nigh to God is often realizing that you're not as close to God as you should be. No matter how long you've been saved, no matter if you'd say, you know, spiritually, I'm doing well. My relationship with God is, is strong, it's solid. This request that we see here in verse 12 should never be far from any of us. Oh God, be not far from me. And the reason why that request should be so frequently focused on and uttered by us is found at the end of the verse where he says this, Oh my God, make haste for my help. When you refuse to acknowledge a distance between you and God, you are essentially setting yourself up to have to face your trials and challenges on your own apart from God's help. By refusing to acknowledge a distance or a disconnect between you and God, you're saying, I don't need God's help. I can handle everything that life throws at me on my own. And let me just ask you by a show of hands, do you need God's help in your life? I know I do. Are there things that you can't deal with on your own? There are in my life. Are there some things that you know you're facing right now that you are completely helpless to deal with on your own? All of us. Every one of us here recognizes that we need God's help. But you know what that means? That all of us should also recognize that in order to get that help that we need, we need to recognize our need to be as close to him as possible. Mm. The distance and disconnect that you might be feeling right now in your relationship with God, that can be repaired. You don't have to feel far away from but you know the reason why a lot of people feel far away from God? Because they're actually far away from God. Right. <laughs> but you have to recognize that if a distance is growing and be able to humble yourself enough to admit that in a request, what we see in verse 12, Oh God, be not far from me. So the first step to having your spiritual batteries recharged is first recognizing that the batteries are dead and being humble enough to act like everything's not okay. And be willing to do something about it. The first step to becoming recharged is requesting God to be close again. The next step that we're going to see is a change that takes place directly related to our humility and dependence on God. Next we see the step of reliance. And we touched on this when we looked at our key verse in verse 20, where we see that the author recognizes that only God can quicken him and bring him up again. And this is important to note. That for most of us, it's our human nature to try to fix things on our own. And spiritually speaking, there are a lot of Christians who recognize, as we see in verse 12, that there's a distance between them and God. They recognize, as we see in verse 20, that they're in need of revival, they're in need of refreshment. But they go about obtaining those things in the wrong ways. Now if you'll keep your finger here in Psalm chapter 71, and turn, turn over to Psalm 85 really quick. Psalm 85, look down at verse 6. Psalm 85, 6 says, Wilt thou not revive us again? Notice something simple, something straightforward that will completely change the way that you look at becoming refreshed, uh, revived, and recharged in your spiritual life. Look there at verse 6 and notice who the dependence is on. Notice who the reliance is on. It doesn't say, Wilt thou not Help me revive myself? Will thou not help me to charge my spiritual battery? He says, no. Wilt thou, all by yourself, God, wilt thou revive us again? There's a complete and total dependence on God to do the work of reviving our hearts. Yeah. Now we're going to see throughout this series steps that we can take to continue to stay plugged in and keep our batteries charged up, so to speak. But notice that the work of revival and recharging is not something that we can do on our own. In Psalm chapter 51, verse 10, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Can I just give you something today that I hope will be an encouragement for you? You don't have to clean your own heart. You don't have to revive yourself. You don't have to, re to renew your own spirit. 
You don't have to recharge your spiritual batteries on your own. In fact, you can't do any of that on your own. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the word of God. Whatever refreshing or rejuvenation that you need spiritually, you can't accomplish it in your own strength or in your own power. And once again, we have to be very humble to accept that. It ties back to humility. It's only through God's power that this takes place. So relying on God to refresh and renew and recharge you, it does not indicate a lack of motivation on your part. It doesn't make you a lazy Christian. It makes you a discerning Christian. When you realize that God, what God wants you to accomplish is impossible for you to do in your own strength. But as Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 27, the things that are impossible of men are possible with God. When we understand and realize that the only way you can become renewed and refreshed in your spiritual life isn't by trying harder, isn't by doing more, the only way to become recharged spiritually is by a total and complete dependence and reliance on God to do the work in you. I have here an old phone. Okay, you probably all have these kind of drugs. Maybe you have 14 of these stuck in a kitchen drawer that none turn on anyway. Um, but you're waiting for them to be revived one day as well. Um, but no matter what this phone is, and this phone hasn't been turned on, and I don't even know how long. That's the girls are on it for trying to take pictures or something with it. Um, I'm trying to try now. It's completely dead. There, there's nothing this phone can do. I can set the phone here, and you know what? I can. This phone can try as hard as it wants to turn back on. It's not going to do it. I, it can't do it on its own. It needs to be plugged in. It needs to be plugged into the source that can actually provide the, the, the charging that it needs. And we look at the examples of complete reliance in our text of, of God to do the the work of refreshment here. And if we look at verse 15, we see that there's a lot of other verses that indicate a total and complete reliance on God to do the work. In verse 15 it says, My mouth shall show forth thy, unright thy righteousness and thy salvation. Verse 16 says, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. At the end of verse 18 it mentions thy power. Verse 19 says, Thy righteousness. Look at all those references to complete and total reliance and dependence on God. Thy righteousness, thy salvation, your strength, your righteousness. Notice in, in the text that we've read, there's no mention of relying on our own strength or our own power or our own righteousness to try to refresh ourselves. Now, there's an old saying that's almost become cliche when people say, let go and let God. You might have, you might have to let go of trying to refresh your own spiritual life and let God do that. Why? You can't do it on your own. You have to understand that we, we, you can't rely on your own righteousness. You can't rely on your own salvation. You can't rely on your own strength. And here's the thing we see very clearly, not just from this text, but all throughout the Bible, God doesn't ask you to. God doesn't try, ask you to try to live this life apart from his power. Right. Uh, he doesn't ask you to try to do anything in your own strength. Right. If you're trying to live for the Lord and get closer to him while depending on your own ability to recharge and refresh your own spirit, you're spinning your wheels. Mm -hmm. And instead of being recharged, you don't live in a constant state of feeling burnt out spiritually. Asking yourself, just wondering, you know, I, I'm doing this and this and this and this. How come I don't feel refreshed? Because the things that you're taking, up, you're, you're taking things up behind yourself that you are intended to depend on God to do. If your first inclination is to go home and start reading the Bible and reading 20 chapters a day to become more refreshed and recharged, you might do that for a while, but more than likely, you're going to get burned out. You're better off relying on God's direction and only reading one verse of the Bible than you are if you're going to read the, the Bible in all of its entirety in your own strength and your own wisdom. And I know that sounds counterintuitive. We think if, if something is off spiritually, and I want to correct it. I've got to do more. I've got to work harder. When what we see here is really the answer isn't us doing more. The answer is relying on God to do all. Yeah. Let me just ask you a simple question. Have you trusted in God and God alone to complete?
completely forgive you and free you of sin and save your soul. If you trusted in God and God alone to make you a new creature. If you trusted in God and God alone to change your life the way you once were. Are you trusting in God and God alone to prepare a place for you? If you can put your faith and trust in everything that God has promised to do in the future, then what makes you think you have to depend on yourself to, re- to recharge and refresh your life right here yeah. on life? There you go. Hmm. What makes you think that you can refresh or recharge the life that only God can save and change? Hmm. Let me ask you another question. If you consider your life and come to the conclusion that you need your spiritual batteries recharged, who do you think that is better equipped to bring about that refreshment, you or God? You don't have to do this alone. You shouldn't be trying to do it alone because we see our effects. It cannot be done alone. Think about how much more productive you would be, spiritually speaking, if all of us, if we would give all of our burdens and struggles to God the way they tell us to. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Casting all your cares on Him. When we walk through our spiritual lives and and come to the realization that our batteries are in need of recharging, oftentimes it's an indication that we're carrying too many burdens on our own. Over our our house next door, we have a, a, I don't know what it is, but our our panel box, that's about as thick as I can get when it comes to tools or anything related to that, or electric, a panel box. If we have the, the microwave on and the air conditioning on, something's getting turned off. It pops the panel box. Why? It's overcharging the brakes. It can't take. So what happens? It flips off. And what happens in our own spiritual lives? When we take on too much, part of us just has to switch off. We get burnt out. We, we weren't designed to carry the burden and load that oftentimes we take on ourselves. We end up carrying burdens on ourselves that God invites us and asks us to cast on him. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Yeah. For I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. Yeah. God wants you to be at peace. He doesn't want you to be overburdened, overwhelmed, anxious, and stressed out all the time. If you, if you look through the fruit of the Spirit, you know what you'll find? Busyness is not a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Worry is not a fruit of the Spirit. Wow. Anxiety is not a fruit of the Spirit. So what is that an indication of? It's an indication of that you're taking too much on yourself because God would never bring those things into your heart. This goes on in Matthew 11 says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus essentially tells all of his children, says, Go ahead, give me all your burdens. All your cares. Give them to me. And where he is cast. Stay wherever you are. Don't, don't even worry about this. Just throw them. Uh, you don't have to come and neatly present them to me. Just, just throw them as far as you can. I'll pick them up. I'll carry the burden. You don't have to do it on your own. Give me your heavy burdens and, and take my burdens. Trade your heavy load for my lighter load. Trade your difficulties for some relief. Trade your worry for some peace. Trade your stress for some joy. And when we're lacking in the fruit of the Spirit, it's often an indication we're trying to do too much on our own. Spirit, and we see biblically, trying to do, oftentimes, trying to do things that we've never been told to do. Trying to do things that God said he would do for us. Now, does that mean that we're never going to have difficulties in our lives? Absolutely not. John said, in this world, ye shall have tribulation. That's inevitable. But what you do with your burdens is a choice. You can continue to carry them on your own and have them weigh you down. Or you can turn them over to the Lord and let him carry those burdens for you. And when you do that, you'll be able to breathe again. You'll be able to rest again. You won't be as anxious or stressed because you recognize you don't have to carry your burdens alone because you were never designed and intended to carry all your burdens alone by yourself. And we see that a way that we can make a transition from carrying our burdens by ourselves to giving them to the Lord is by looking 
in our text in realizing that when it comes to recharging our spiritual batteries, it involves total dependence and reliance on God to do what we can do. What does that come back to again? Humility. Yeah. We have to be humble enough to admit, I can't do this on my own. We have to be humble enough to, to realize there are some things, a lot of things, that no matter how hard I try, no matter what, what I try to do, I can't do this. I can't bear this burden by myself. And after the, the request, and after the reliance, we see the next step of recharging our spiritual batteries, which is response, which is our response. Now, after turning our cares over to the Lord and depending on Him to bring about the spiritual refreshing that, we, that we're looking for, there are two possible outcomes. Now, more often than not, Christians might pray to God about their concerns and burdens, but then continue to be just as anxious and worried about them even after they pray. But the alternative to that is what we see here in our text. The alternative to that is what God wants us to have here in our text. After relying on God and depending on Him to bring um, bring about the spiritual uh, recharging and refreshment, if you look at verse 14 with me, it says, I will hope continually. If you'll say that out loud with me, I will hope continually. Want to know how to ward off those negative thoughts? How to ward off and guard against the anxiety that persists even after you've prayed to God about them, actually expect that God is going to answer your prayers. Actually believe that God has heard you and is going to respond to your petitions. In the book of James, the Bible tells us that when we pray to God, it says to do so, nothing wavering. Pray without any doubts. James says, let him ask in faith. And then later on, as James continues in James chapter 1, verse 7, it says that if we pray to God while still having doubts in our own hearts whether God is going to answer or not, he says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything mm -hmm. of the Lord. The Bible makes it very clear in no uncertain terms. God says, you want to ensure that your prayers won't be answered? You want to guarantee that your burdens won't be lifted? Want to make sure that you never get any results from your prayer? Keep worrying and stressing about things even after you've already prayed about them to God. So what should we do instead? After we turn everything over to God, what should we do? Look at verse 14. It says, hope continue. Now the word hope in this context isn't just a wish. This isn't like me like saying, I hope Miami beats Clemson on Saturday. Or I hope I'm going to have sausage gravy next Saturday. I do it, hope that. But no, no. <laughs> the hope that we see here in verse 14, it, it's not the same way that we use the word in relation to wishful thinking or something along those lines. The word hope that we see here in verse 14 means expectant anticipation. It's the same word that Titus uses in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, where he says, looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as Christians, we don't just hope that Christ is coming back. We know it. We're sure of it. We expect it. We anticipate it. And that's what we see here in verse 14. Expecting anticipation of God bringing about the refreshment that we're asking him for. But notice, it's not enough to just hope one time. It's not enough to just kind of hope inconsistently. Verse 14 says the key is to hope Continue. What we see is expecting and anticipating God, having hope in God that is constant and continuous in our lives. There's an element of that word continually that can be illustrated by thinking about a sink. Now, choosing to hope continually is like walking over the sink and turning on the water and just letting it run. Continually as opposed to turning the water on and then turning it back off. You might think, well, what does that have to do with hope? There are a lot of people who turn the hope on, so to speak, when things are going well, yeah. when they're healthy, when they're, they're financially secure, when their kids are, are, are living the way that, that, that they should be living, when their family's doing well, they're hopeful, they trust God, and they turn, they, they turn the hope on. And it's just running. <clears throat> But when things aren't going the way that they anticipate, 
when things aren't going the way that they want them to, it's almost like they reach over and that hope goes on full blast and things are going, well, they just turn it off. Yeah. That hope is turned off and then they turn on the other faucet, which is instead of hope and joy, is nothing but anxiety and worry and stress. And this is one area where I find that we are all wired differently. Now, there are some people whose natural nature is just to be hopeful. Now, there are some people who are just glass half full type of people. There are types of people who just naturally have that gift of encouragement. Why? Because they're always encouraged themselves. You know what you know something? You can't encourage somebody else if you're depressed yourself. You know what you're you can't give some you can't give somebody else what you don't have. You, know, you have to be encouraged your, in your own heart before you can give encouragement to anybody else. And there's some people who just have that natural disposition. They just seem, they seem to always see the positive in situations. And for some, for some of you here, this might come naturally. It might be your natural disposition. And there's some of you who it might not be your natural disposition to be hopeful. And what I found in my life, it, particularly in spiritual areas, that areas that aren't part of my natural disposition need to be developed by this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul writes to Timothy and tells him to, to discipline himself for godliness. The term that, that Paul uses is to exercise. There's some areas of our spiritual walk that don't come naturally to us. And the only way to grow and develop those areas is by exercising them. Some of you I know through our, our interactions and our, and our relationships together, your natural disposition is just to be hopeful. And some people, let's just be honest, we're not wired that way. Our, our default setting is not set to hope, so to speak. And we, we have to discipline ourselves to develop that disposition. So how do we do that? Well, if you're not naturally or spontaneously hopeful, how do you develop that? Or if your natural disposition is to be hopeful, how can you continue to grow and remain strong in that area? Go to the end of verse 14, it says, I will praise thee more and more. Now notice... Verse 14, where it says, hope, we talk about hope and continuing, praising God more and more. This comes right after, it immediately follows after making the request and acknowledging that there's a distance between him and God. And that he is completely and totally reliant on God for help. And yet, the response is to be hopeful. Well, how can you develop discipline in your own life to, be, to become more hopeful, we see at the end of verse 14, by praising God. And here's the key, praising Him more and more. Uh, just like it's not enough to just be hopeful every now and then, if you want to have your spiritual batteries recharged, you have to hope continually. And how do you develop that? How do you train yourself with that? By praising God more than you ever have. This is the key to developing a hopeful spirit is Choosing to remain hopeful in the midst of challenges, one way we can develop that strength is by praising God. If we look at it at the end of verse 14, we notice it's not just praising Him as much as you already are, but praising Him more than you ever have. I guarantee you that if you start walking, living your life, just walking around thinking about and dwelling on the goodness and grace of God and praising Him for that more than you ever have, you know what's going to happen? You will become much more hopeful. But if you think you can praise God on Sunday and Wednesday and then kind of reach over and turn the faucet off, sporadically turn hope on and off throughout the week, don't be surprised if you find yourself struggling to continue to have a hopeful outlook. Yeah. So how can we start if we want to be able to hope continually, as the text says? How can we develop this aspect of our spiritual lives that's not part of our natural disposition? When well, we see the outline given by starting to praise God more and more, and then in verses 17 and 18 it says this, I have declared thy wondrous works. And in verse 18, I have showed thy strength unto this generation. What is that talking about? Sharing your faith with other people. When you talk to other people and share all the wonderful things that Christ has done for you, all the amazing things that God has done for you, when you share his strength with others, it will cause you to develop a more helpful spirit. If you find yourself struggling to maintain hope, 
If you find yourself in need of refreshing or recharging your spiritual batteries, let me just ask you, when was the last time you shared Jesus with someone else? When was the last time you shared your faith with someone else? Because something changes when you start talking about Jesus to others. Have you ever been in the workplace and somebody's having a really hard day? And you walk up to them and you ask them about their grandkids, and all of a sudden their decision changes. They pull out their phone, they pull out their wallet, and they're all, all, all of a sudden all the stress, all the cares of the job, everything they're upset about, when they're thinking about their grandkids, they're talking about their grandkids, what happens? They have peace. They have joy. Same thing happens in our own hearts when we walk up to people who are hurting and say, Can I tell you about my Lord? Can I tell you about Jesus? Oftentimes, the, the spiritual deadness of our lives is in direct correlation because we're not, we're not talking about God with anybody else. We're not sharing Him. And obviously, it's good for us, it's good for other people to share the gospel with them. But we see here, spiritually speaking, it's really good for us to share the gospel with other people. Evangelism isn't just about reaching lost souls for the Lord. Evangelism is developing the discipline in our own lives to be thinking about um, joyful things going forward. Instead of focusing on all the things that are going wrong in your life, it forces you to reevaluate and recognize all the good things that God has done for you. But if sharing the gospel is never at the forefront of your priorities, it's really easy for all the negative things to crowd into our, our thoughts and minds and just take over. And soon... The hope that we could have, the hope that we see that Christ wants us to have, is overshadowed by the anxiety, fear, and stress that so many Christians live in. Again, sharing your faith might be something that comes naturally, or it might be something that you have to develop. But either way, as a child of God, knowing that it's God's will for us to be reaching other people for Him, should we really expect to stay on fire for the Lord if, he's, if we're not doing what He's commanded us to do? If we're not doing what He showed us Specifically, this is a way you can turn the hope back on in your life. Then notice what happens next. After we've requested God to be close to us, after we've relied on Him completely, after we've responded through praising Him and sharing Him with others, we see the result. We see the recharging of the spiritual batteries that take place in verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, Thou which hast shown me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Verse 21, Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. The author is saying, I've been through a lot. He used that phrase. He said, I I've had great and sore troubles. I've been afflicted. I've been hurt. I've been beaten up. I've been worried. I've been anxious. I've been stressed. I've been overwhelmed. But you'll bring me up again. You'll reach down and pick me up. You'll increase my greatness and comfort on every side. And here we see the return of spiritual life. The refreshment of hope. We see the recharging of our spiritual life being brought up, being increased, being comforted. Eric, can you come up here real quick? Quickly. Okay. Right, say hi to everybody, okay? So, what we see here... First time she's actually obeyed in about two weeks, so I'll take it. Um, but what we see here is when our own children come to us, what happens if, if everybody were to come up to me and say, Dad, I'm hurt. Dad, I'm sad. Dad, I'm lonely. I'm struggling. Am I going to say, good luck, Eric. Figure it out on your own. You knew better than this. Or am I going to, as we see here in the text, am I going to reach down, pick her up, See in verse 21. Look back at verse 21 with me. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Now what happens when a child is in their, the arms of their father or their mom or their grandma or grandpa? They're comforted. It says here they're comforted on every side. Holding with one hand, comforting with the other. We see another word there in verse 21. Thou shalt increase my greatness. What's that talking about? Strength. You know what? The, the, the trials that we're going through, they're real, they're relevant, but they're nowhere near as scary when somebody else is, is holding them. Mm -hmm. Now, those monsters in the closet, monsters on the bed, they're not as real when somebody comes in and, and, and convinces you that everything's going to be okay. And sometimes,
sometimes it is, is Christians, we can develop a sense of trying to be so independent in our own lives. When we run to pray, when all we have to do is run to our Heavenly Father, and He says He'll reach down, He'll comfort us. He'll give us the strength. Now, when we think back to the When you think back to what we talked about at the beginning of James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Now, we get back here, we've been using this phone illustration once again. This, this phone is dead. It can't charge its own. But it has a source, and it can. But notice here, this cord isn't going to reach forever. This cord is only about This phone has to draw near to the source when he gets plugged in. Right. Spiritually speaking, God watches me closely. Yeah. But it doesn't say, we, we, we've been through this many times. God never says, do whatever you want, I'll follow you around, and I'll be like a magnet, just follow you around and can draw close to you no matter what. Mm-hmm. God says, draw nigh to me, then I'll draw nigh to you. That's right. yeah. Yeah. We see the steps here kind of given in our, have our spiritual batteries recharged. Once they've been recharged, how to stay charged up, how to stay plugged in. See, in verse 22 it says, I will praise thee. In verse 23, I will greatly rejoice. Verse 24 says, My tongue shall talk of all thy righteousness all the day long. You notice something interesting there? The same steps that are needed to recharge your spiritual batteries are the same steps that we need to follow in order to keep our spiritual batteries charged up. This is where that word comes continually comes up again. If your spiritual batteries need to be recharged today, we see that the steps given for that. We see the ongoing process that we can use to stay hopeful, to stay committed, to stay growing, and keep increasing in our relationship with the Lord. It comes first back to humility. Verse 12. Oh God, be not far from me. And verse 12. Oh my God, We all need help. Amen. That doesn't make you weak. That makes you human. We all need strength. We all need comfort. That doesn't make that doesn't make you a weak Christian. It makes you a normal Christian. Don't make the mistake of burning your own spiritual batteries out because you feel like you have to do everything on your own. When we have a God who's promised, He wants, He invites us to carry our, cast our burdens on Him. It's not about it. It's not a burden to him. He desires it. See the steps here today. To have our spiritual batteries recharged. We just need to be real with ourselves and real with God about where we are in that process. We gotta have every head bowed and every head closed, so stand to the floor if you play. Be quietly. going to have a traditional altar call this time because we've got a baptism here in a few minutes. But you can have every head bowed and every eye closed. If the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart today, if you recognize that there's a distance between you and God, and your prayer is to recommit your life to Him, to draw close to Him again. You can't get plugged in. You can't get charged up. You can't get plugged back into the source of your strength. You don't take the step of admitting where you are. Take that first step. So your prayer today is to to recommit your life to draw close to God. That's your prayer. If you just slip your hand up, we'll pray with you about that. Now we see those hands. So you can take them down after you've written. If you have difficulty relying on God and depending on Him, then your prayer is just simply to be able to give God your burden. Be able to cast your care on him fully so you can sense the peace, sense the ease that, that God wants you to have. That's your prayer. Can I lift your hand? I'll pray you with it. You know, let me see those hands. Thank you, Dr. If you're having difficulty remaining hopeful, maybe it's just not your natural disposition. Maybe you, your, your default setting is not just to be hopeful. And your prayer today is to make more of an effort to develop that to develop and strengthen a hopeful spirit. If your prayer is, is to praise Him more, if you haven't been 
sharing your faith with others, but you want to commit to these areas, these steps for a more hopeful spirit. You can have your batteries recharged today. You can have a relationship with God that maybe you've never expected. You've never experienced. Well, I'll leave in a word of prayer if you'd like to respond to the Holy Spirit moving in your heart. Please do so from right where you're seated. Dear Lord, we just thank you for those that have responded to your word today, Lord, by indicating that you have moved in their hearts. Lord, I pray for those of you who have requested prayer, that you help them to humble themselves and be willing to draw close to you once again. Yeah. Pray for those that are carrying many burdens. Lord, there's a lot of people yeah. here that are they've got a lot on their plate. Lord, I pray that you'll help them to really turn those cares and burdens over to you. Yeah. I pray that you'll ease their load, that they'll experience that, that they'll sense that in their own lives of a peace that maybe isn't there right now. For those that are having difficulty remaining hopeful, maybe it's just not their natural personality to be hopeful, Lord, I pray that you'll help them to develop that by praising you more and more to all of us, Father, that, that even those that are more hopeful by nature, Lord, that they would continue to praise you more and share you with other people. I pray that as a result of your working in our lives, Lord, that you'll help us to develop these areas of our, of our spiritual walk that you so desire us to have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to prepare now for a, for a baptism, so if you just want to stay seated for a minute, we will get um, arranged and ready for that. And Valerie, if you want to come up and get ready.
Thursday with a Bible study later on. And we're just saying, good to be in your house. We're going to continue to bless Grove for a time together. In Jesus' name. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even wiping out my nose or anything. <laughs>